Well, when you do the book of Genesis, what do you do? Where do you look in archaeology? You go heavily to Mesopotamia for the first 11 chapters. For the first 11 chapters, you've got the Assyrians, and you've got the Akkadians, and then you've got the Sumerians, and you're uh, getting to the beginning of the Assyrians and Babylonians and the other nations. And so you go to archaeology there, and there's some wonderful finds like City of Mari, where a palace of, uh, uh, of 300 rooms was found, and 30,000 clay tablets written in cuneiform, telling about what's going on in that period of time. One of the things that, uh, everything is helpful, they're economic texts telling you what's being grown, what's being sold, what's being bought, how many bushels are needed at the palace, and so on and so forth. There are mathematical texts. There's astrology slash astronomy texts. You know. uh, there are religious texts. There are, uh, as we've talked about, income tax forms. Uh, a lot of economic texts, in other words, that falls in that category. There are letters written from kings of this city to that city. Of course, if you're at Mari, you got letters coming everywhere, and then if they made copies, you got letters going out everywhere, and that's an eye opener. It helps you. It helps to fill in the geography. How do you suppose the history and the geography in these books are filled in? They're filled in by the archaeological discoveries. You see, if we didn't have the discoveries, we wouldn't know about. Uh, we'd know something about the Egyptian pharaohs from uh, a guy who worked out the dynasties, but we wouldn't know much, but now we can fill in those spaces. We wouldn't have anything other than the Greek Old Testament translation of the Old Testament, and they have the Old Testament in Hebrew telling us about the Assyrian and Babylonian kings. We'd have that, but we wouldn't have know anything about Sennacherib or anything about Nebuchadnezzar. Now we know what, he ate for bre what they ate for breakfast, we know they, you know, died of, uh, like Ramsey the Great, we, we believe from x-rays he died probably of abscessed teeth, uh, he had ruled 67 years and everybody was waiting for the old man to die, he outlived his first 13 heirs, <coughs> and the word around uh, the palace was, I think it's now, I think it's now, <laughs> finally, 67 years was a long time to reign, and he had uh, abscessed tooth for a long, teeth for a long time. He suffered for a long time. He really did. Well, we know that kind of thing. We know, you know, what food they ate. We, we know where they went on their campaigns. We know who their enemies and who their friends were. And by doing all that, we can piece together a wonderful history of the ancient Near East now and fill in the Bible. So you, that's just a little bit about what archaeology can do. Does that make sense? Okay. When you get into the last part of, when you get into the middle part of Genesis, now you're in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You're in what we call the the middle, uh, the middle Egyptian period. You're in uh, all these periods are divided in different countries by the late Bronze Age, the middle Bronze Age, the early Bronze Age. But you're in the uh, the middle Bronze Age. You're in the middle Egyptian kingdom period, and so because of that, we can start dating things. So that's the patriarchs. You get down to Joseph, and uh, it isn't long until Joseph is shipped off to Egypt. Now, we've been to Egypt once already in the book of uh, Genesis, when Abraham went down there. And by the way, let's just assume Abraham saw the pyramids. They had been there for about 700 years. Now think about that. If we have Abraham dated anywhere near correctly, then the pyramids had been there for between six and nine hundred years, depending on whose dating system for Abraham to use. But my dating system, about seven centuries. They had been there, the main three pyramids and a lot of other pyramids. And that gives you a little perspective, doesn't it, of what we're talking about. When you get down to the end of the book of Genesis, you have Joseph, and uh, he's going to Egypt. We now know that there were these foreign rulers, and we won't get into a lot heavily tonight because of Egypt next week. These foreign rulers called the Hyksos, uh, a term that was mistranslated for a long time as shepherd kings, turned out not to be the case. 
the word Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S, and that'll be on a sheet next handout next week. Were uh, foreign rulers. We're pretty sure now they were Amorites coming from uh, the land of Syria, Palestine. Uh, of course, that's something else we haven't had time to spend a lot of time with. Who were these different peoples running around? Well, Hammurabi and his whole group of people were Amorites. And uh, when the Amorites first started coming into Mesopotamia, the Sumerians said, oh, barbaric. These, these people, uh, look at some of the things they do, uncouth, uncivilized, these Semites who are coming in here. Well, uh, they took over the uh, ancient Near East, basically. They, they, were, they, they were everywhere. Uh, and then you had, so then you had the, the old Babylonian kingdom, the, new Bab the old Babylonian, the old Assyrian period, so on and so forth. Well, you work your way as you're going through the Bible, you get into Exodus, of course, and where you spend your time. You spend most of your time in Egypt. And you're trying to decide, is this in the, is this the, uh, in the, uh, you know it's the, uh, you know the block of time that it is, the New Kingdom period, but is it the 18th dynasty? Is it the 19th dynasty? Which dynasty is it? And so you're dealing with, is it Tutmosis III, who was Napoleon of uh, Egypt? Or was it Ramses the Great? Why was he called Ramses the Great? Well, he had, uh, did a lot of building. He did a lot of stealing. He would take a monument and erase the name and put his name on the monument. <laughs> but he did a lot of building on top of that. Built on the cheap. He built a really cheap. Scraped their name off, put his name on. Maybe he should be called the great because of the babies he had. 79 sons and 59 daughters. Just a few years ago, the tombs of his sons were found. It turned out to be the entrance was under King Tut's tomb. And it had been sealed and caused the rubbish from digging out other tombs had been piled that way. And it blocked out all of them. And a man named Weeks found it. it took him years. <laughs> just, made it, just I made that up. I thought that weeks took him years, not months, years. Uh, but seriously, uh, they found uh, room after room after room after room after room. And what in the world is this? It turned out to be where his sons were buried. The ones that didn't become pharaohs, he said. He will be succeeded by Merneptah. And Merneptah will leave us a stela. You don't know what a stela is now. It's not a great buy in an Italian shopping market. A stela. <laughs> made that one up. Wish I hadn't made that one up. <laughs> it's, it's this, this stela, which I couldn't find in the Cairo Museum. I said to, the, to the, one of the guys there, I said, why can't I find the Israeli stela? He said, don't call it the Israeli steel, I'll call it the Merneptah steel. <laughs> That's why you can't find it. They had it buried away. He had the, we went behind things, and finally there it was. And in the Israeli museum, they have a picture of it, and there Israel is in white. Boom, Israel just jumps out at you in white. It's not a replica, it's just a big picture, bigger than the steel, or, or just about as big as the steel. But you have there the, the word Israel, the first time Israel ever appears outside the Bible that we have. It may appear someplace, but we don't have it. That's the first time the name Israel appears outside the Bible. About 1220 and 1230, depending on how you date Merneptah. You, you ask, well, why do you say how you date these people? Because there are different dating systems argued about. We've talked about that with the Babylonian kings. Uh... I just got a test time from my PhD students, the first little quiz. I can't remember how many questions there were now, about 275, I think. One wrote back and said, you really know how to give a test? <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote back and said, well, it's graded by grace. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, 
the, they're, they're, like I told you last week, there are two dating systems for ancient Mesopotamia. But as you come closer and closer, there's only one dating system. Everything gets pretty close. But in Egypt, there are two or three dating systems. And these, they may be, they're not gigantically apart, but they may be 20, 30 years apart. Somebody will have Ramses the Great at 1310, 1303. Somebody having it for 1292. And so that's not drastic, but you'll see these different. It, it, it matters sometimes, though. It matters when you get ready to place Moses. Okay. We will get into Moses at the end tonight. We'll do that. Okay. Get a little bit into Egypt. Um, as you come on, as you come through the Bible, then Exodus is heavily, of course, going to be in Egypt, and then the end of it, you're going to be out, out now moving to the wilderness. And so um, through the Pentateuch, that's where you're going to be. You're going to be making your way toward Jordan. You're going to you know, cross the Red Sea. We're going to talk about that next week with the Sea of Reeds at Red Sea. You're going to um, be finally getting to a place called Shittim. Uh, we went to Mount Nebo in November, and we were able to look over the hill, and there was Shittim. It's, uh, the village is still called Shittim where the Israelites camped, down below. Now there's two villages arguing over which one is the real Shittim. That's the only problem. But there, you know, there are two villages saying, we're Shittim, one's over here and one's over here. But there you can see both of them from exactly the same spot on Mount Nebo. When you get into Joshua and Judges, you are now uh, in the land of Canaan. You're now crossing over in, in the land of Canaan and you have, again, we have some wonderful records to help us. We have, uh, you're, you're beginning to find things uh, in Canaan form in Israel. There are not very many things found. But at the city of Hazor, Hazor, in the northeast, they're beginning to find Canaan form tablets. And on one of those tablets, there is the name Jabin. And Jabin, or Jabin, is king of Hazor in the Bible. He appears, he appears in the second time when, um, uh, when Deborah and Barak come along. Deborah, that's the bee, the bumblebee, that's what Deborah means. And Barak means lightning. And there was just a few prime ministers ago, one named Barak. Right? General Barak. Ehud Barak. Two names from the book of Judges. <laughs> Two names, two judges from the book of Judges. Ehud and Barak. His mama named him Ehud, one after one judge, and Barak after the second judge. Okay? Um, now you've got the, you're drawing from Mesopotamia to some degree because when uh, Joshua is at Jericho and Achan goes and takes things he shouldn't take, one was a Babylonian robe. You say a Babylonian robe robe he shouldn't have taken. The word Shinar appears there with that and that's one of the names for the one of the territories of Mesopotamia. Like in Genesis 11. 1. Then you end up uh, drawing from Egyptian history too. Why? Well the Bible says in the book of Joshua that uh, God would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And uh, if you went to Israel 40 years ago, it wasn't near the land of milk and honey it is today. And before that, and during the time, centuries, when the Turks cut down all the trees. The Turks cut all the trees down to be used for the railroads and other things. And therefore, much of Israel became either swamp or desert. Now, what's one of the things that they're doing? Planting trees, planting trees, planting trees. Still a lot of rock. A lot of rock in Jordan. There is a proverb in Israel that says when God created the earth, there were no rocks. He didn't create rocks on the earth. He created the land, trees, etc. And But he needed some rocks, and so he made two giant rocks. And one he put in the rest of the world, and the other he put in Israel. <laughs> you understand? There's so many rocks. 
Well, guess what? Jordan has the same story. <laughs> <laughs> but there are places when you're in Samaria and a few places in Galilee, North Galilee, north of the Sea of Galilee, when you see this mountain, this hill, literally covered with rocks, like some giant came and stacked rocks on every inch, it looks like, or just about every inch of it, and you say, well, somebody must have gathered up all the rocks and put on this hill. And then you see the next hill, it's got the same number of rocks, and the next hill has the same number of rocks, the next hill has the same number of rocks. Why Israel didn't have the biggest fortresses in the world, I'll never know. Because, <laughs> boy, they had the rocks to make it with, right there. What else do you learn like when you're looking at Joshua? Well, we now are able, because of some dedicated work of some scholars, we now have found, well, I, let me finish about the land of milk and honey. Uh, people would say, well, I just don't think Israel's like that. And then suddenly you find the records of Tutmosis III of Egypt telling about his campaign. Now, he's the one who I think is the Pharaoh of the oppression. Not the Exodus, I think his son, Amenhotep II. But Tutmosis III was known, is known in historical circles as the Napoleon of Egypt. And he made an adventure, a venture into Syria, Palestine, and he leaves us records of what he brought back, an incredible amount of grain and animals. And when he was there, he captured Megiddo, if you haven't heard of Megiddo, you've all heard of Armageddon. That's Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. The Greek, Har Megiddon, and sometimes written Armageddon because they don't write the rough breathing. And therefore, uh, that's where Armageddon came from. We have, I have a great video on Megiddo. It, was just, it only takes about 10 or 15 minutes to show thought about showing it, we just got so much to do in here. Uh, in any case, um, we have records now proving it was a land of milk and honey. We also kept noticing the way the book of Joshua was put together and thought that was kind of strange in a way, almost like somebody's military log, but of course we didn't have any parallels until we found Egyptian military logs, which parallel. Does it just like the book of Joshua? Does it parallel? And I skipped over this, and I shouldn't have. In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, a man named uh, Meredith Klein did a lot of work, as well as uh, some other people, and kept, when we found the Hittite, uh, when we found the Assyrian uh, treaties, uh, covenants, we noticed that the book of uh, Deuteronomy was very much like the treaties of a king called Ezerhaddon. You may not know him. He was the son of, uh, he was the grandson of, uh, uh, the son of uh, Sennacherib. Ashurbanipal was his son. And uh, he was a powerful king too. He just didn't get the press that uh, he's only mentioned one time in the Bible. So he didn't get the press that Sennacherib did. But, but in any case, his treaties were uh, similar to the biblical treaties, and people said, well, see, we told you, uh, at this time, the, the uh, period of rationale and criticism had come in, the, just up to the uh, Reformation and a little bit after, in that period of time, people either believed the Bible was true or not true. That's what you had. You had basically two groups. The ones that believed it was true believed it was true. The others just rejected it. And then shortly thereafter, until the last few years, or several years, we went through the modern age where German scholars and some American scholars took on the Bible and criticized the authorship of Moses that he couldn't have written the Pentateuch and they criticized the Bible as not being historical, and even to Layard in the 1840s and 50s discovered Nineveh and Tala, they were saying those cities didn't exist and those came to the Bible didn't exist, but that turned out to be now. That's totally accepted. But there were a lot of things that were uh, under, under high criticism.
And this period ended just a few years ago, and it was called the modern period. And basically, these many of these people who uh, were, were, were really searching for the truth. They, they uh, took wrong assumptions, and they had to read, but, but their goal was not to destroy Moses the Ossip. The, the original goal was to explain some of the, they thought, contradictions and problems. And they came to those conclusions, and that became the teaching of many, many of the universities. <coughs> then, in the last few decades, we have the group after that who uh, are more radical than ever and do not even believe in truth of any kind. They're called the postmodern, which is really a funny term, the postmodern. <laughs> that means because we had given this critical age the name modern period, and so the next group comes along, we have to come up with another name, and since after we call them the postmodern. They're right here with you now. They're around. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering that modern, is that Bright and Albright? Is that the group you're talking about? Uh, to some degree, but Bright and Albright were the moderates of that of that group. Oh, I just wonder if they were in that time frame. Yeah, they were in that time frame, yes. But it was Bellhausen and people in Germany right. uh, and uh, uh, people uh, at Harvard. There was a, a scholar named Pfeiffer at Harvard. Uh, there were scholars coming along saying, if it's in the Bible, it can't be true. If it's anything within the Bible, it's, they, they started out with the assumption it was wrong, false or whatever. And then they, you know, and that's what happened. And now this, the group right now, basically, and this is, I didn't mean to get into this, but the idea is, uh, you know, is there really any truth at all? Everything is relative to each other and, you know, so on and so forth. Does that, does that make a little bit of sense? Okay. Well, there's been a shifting back. There's been a shifting back. What happened in the, uh, the, the better scholars in that period of the so-called modern period, there were some very dedicated uh, scholars at you know, Westminster and other places who really were quite good, uh, who were not liberal. They were not even moderate. They were very, very defend the Bible. A large group of uh, Westminster did, and that's why the breakup between Princeton and, Princeton and Westminster. What has happened also in the post, so-called postmodern period, there has arisen a large number of uh, archaeologists and Bible scholars of different faiths around Trinity, for example, in Chicago, and, and uh, a little school called Asbury in Wilmore, Kentucky, and many schools that have produced some extremely well-qualified scholars who believe the Bible is the Word of God and have a very high view of Scripture. And so that number has grown uh, just in a shocking, positive way. I went to an archaeological convention at, uh, at Louisville uh, Baptist Seminary uh, four or five years ago, and the 12 speakers all had degrees from he two, or three, two from Hebrew Union, uh, Harvard, New York, and they were there, the 12 of them. Alan Millard was the keynote speaker from the University of Liverpool in England. All 12 were there to show and demonstrate <laughs> that the Bible was authoritative and was the Word of God and was accurate. And all of them had big degrees behind their names. So there was now, in the period we're talking about Bright and Albright, there were, and after there were people like K. E. Kitchen, who's still alive in England, who is a great defender uh, of the Bible. There are, and uh, unfortunately, England doesn't have a great number anymore because uh, only just a small number, like 3% to 5% go to church in England now. Yeah. But you still have some uh, Donald Weissman, uh, F.F. Bruce died in 1990, and people like that who were not of the, the modern school but defended the Bible. But anyway, so this, I, I don't know why I got into that, but, uh, but it, it's kind of important to know what's happening. And there's some really good positive signs, I want to tell you. Some very fine scholars that are in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s that uh, are out there defending the Bible as the Word of God. And so that's really encouraging. Okay, sorry, uh, I strayed there. So, uh, but in any case, the, uh, we now have found these logs in Egypt, and the book of Joshua is, is just like one of those logs. So I had mentioned that, but right before that, the book of Deuteronomy. 
I, I, that's what I'd gone back to. Um, and so we found these uh, treaty tablets of Ezer Haddon, and people said, well, that's great, but it proves our view, our view that uh, Deuteronomy wasn't written in 1400 or 1300 or a period like that. Ezer Haddon is, you're talking more like now, you know, the 7th century, and, and therefore that shows that the Deuteronomy is late, late, late. But things backfired. We found the Hittite text, the cuneiform Hittite text of kings like Shupilu Umash, Mershilish, Khatishilish, and those guys, and we found their treaties. And their treaties were identical to the book of Deuteronomy, and they dated from the 14th and 13th century. So using their own argument, <laughs> whatever it's closest to must be the period it comes from, boom, you all of a sudden have uh, these treaties. Now we have lots and lots of them. There's a book about a guy named Hoffner who has all these treaties in translation showing you. And now we, we look and find out, and I'm going to just quickly tell you what it's like because we understand the book of Deuteronomy is nothing but one giant treaty covenant. That's what it is. And, and just in a nutshell, here's what happens. The treaty begins with a... Uh, a statement of, of who is writing the treaty. The Lord. These are Lord vassal treaties. I am Shupilulu Umash, the great king of the Hittites. And I did this for your people, and I did this for your father. Your father and I had a treaty, we did such and such. It tells who he is. Uh, it goes into a historical prologue telling you the background. And then comes to the rules and regulations for the new treaty. Because you see, when a king died, the successor, if he had an empire, or whatever he had, he had to go out and reestablish it. He got to go back to all those kings, either write a new treaty, or beat their heads in. <laughs> and make them sign right on the bottom line here. Uh, Lord Vassal Treaty. Kind of get the idea. Lord Vassal. Uh, New Jersey, when I was growing up. The Mafia and somebody who had a clothing store. <laughs> <laughs> they had a treaty. It was a good treaty. As long as you did what they said, nobody else would burn your store down. Because they'd get mad. And they didn't want to get the Mafia mad. You see. And so anyway, the treaty would go, here are the rules. And then it would list the blessings if you kept the rules and the curses if you didn't. And then it was sworn to by many deities. Now there were sometimes a couple more sections, a couple of less sections, but that was the basic structure. That's just Deuteronomy, just like that. There are different sections of the Bible. Exodus 20 is just is like that when the Ten Commandments are given. And so what we found out that the Ten Commandments were a part of the larger covenant. It begins, I am the Lord your God. Enough said. <laughs> Shupi had to go on and on and on <laughs> about who he was. The Hammurabi goes forever telling who he is. The shepherd of the people of Ur. The provider of the people of Lagash. Blah, blah, blah. On and on and on and on and on telling you who he is. And for just line after line after line, you just get worn out. Would you just shut up? That's all. The Code of Hammurabi just goes on and on and on. His prologue is big. <coughs> then, the next one is, this is what I've done for you. And that's what Hammurabi goes crazy with. I am the Lord your God. That's the, the speaker speaking. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Enough said. The next thing you know, you have the, you have the Ten Commandments. And what else do you get? There, and especially in Deuteronomy, the blessings and the cursing. One group stands on Mount Ebal, one stands on Mount Gerizim. And the blessings are read and cursed, and the people say, Amen. Amen. And you have, in the ancient Near Eastern treaties, you don't have to have it. In the Bible, God says, you know, I swear by myself, or the heavens and the earth could be my, my witnesses that I created, if you want. 
but uh, you have uh, the god Marduk and the god Asher and the god Baal and on and on and on and on. 85 deities swear, uh, a witness you're swearing by their names. If you break the treaty, all of them are going to get you. <laughs> you understand how it works? Well, the book of Deuteronomy is a treaty covenant. And Meredith Klein at Westminster wrote a commentary, a small commentary on Deuteronomy. And he called it the Treaty of the Great King. A wonderful little commentary on Deuteronomy. The Treaty of the Great King. Well, you get into uh, you get into Judges, and of course you're you're, you're in this period. Uh, in Joshua and Judges, what do you find in archaeology? Well, there was a king who lived in Egypt. Again, I'm jumping to Egypt, but just very briefly, named Akhenaten. We'll talk about him next week. He uh, got involved in a special aspect of the sun god. He worshipped the god Aten, the solar disk, and left the worship of Amun Re, the major worship at Thebes. And he went several miles away and built himself a new town, and he named it after himself and after the god Aten. His name was, he was Amenhotep, uh, you'll see that next week, but anyway. He was uh, Amenhotep the fourth, Amenophis the fourth. What happens is a lot of these Egyptians have a Greek name and an Egyptian name. They do because Manetho left us uh, the dynasties. This, uh, this guy who lived later, but all the dynasties, and we follow that, whether it's very good or not, we, we follow the so-called dynasty. Then we dug these people up, so to speak. <laughs> and we found out their real name, the, the Egyptian name. <coughs> so when you look at one, you'll see, oh, his name is Amenhotep the, the uh, uh, third. Oh, yeah, uh, fourth. Oh, yes, he's also called in Greek Amenhotep the fourth. Oh, he gave himself another name, Akhenaten, named himself after, connected with the sun deity. And he built himself a town which he called Octaton, which is almost exactly the same spelling. Okay? the uh, horizon, the horizon of the god Aten. Aten, the solar disk came over. Uh, well, anyway, things didn't go well. He ended up, uh, had a king after him named King Khankaman, that we call King Tut, who is one of the weakest, most unimportant kings in all of Egypt. So we found his grave. And that had not been... Uh, discovered openly, it had been discovered, somebody had found a way in there and made a tunnel and were probably, was probably going in and taking things as they needed. But they died some way. Mm -hmm. and, and their secret died with them. You know. And uh, so it was discovered by Howard Carter. It basically was totally intact. Unbelievable. If you don't think it was large for this boy king, this really unimportant king, just go to the second floor of the Cairo Museum, and it takes up much of the floor. Because they spread it out like Kraft's cheese. You see? And it was stacked together in the, in, in the tomb, but it was a good-sized tomb anyway. But that was a very unimportant Pharaoh. Uh, but, he, but there were some letters in this period of time. Letters sent from all over the world. I mean that in the ancient Near Eastern sense. People from a uh, uh, king from uh, the island of uh, Cyprus called Elashia at that time wrote ten letters. The king of Tyre, his name was Abimelech, Akkadian Abimilki, but in Hebrew Abimelech, wrote uh, six letters. I got the backwards. He wrote Ten letters. The other guy wrote six. I did a paper. Bob Talbot, my best friend, Hebrew Union, did a paper on the King of uh, Cyprus, and they hit one of his letters. It's been a hundred hours. I wrote on Elamarna 147, King of uh, Tyre, Abimelech, 100 hours, and uh, we did get A's on the paper. <laughs> I'm glad to say. Uh, and uh, the last two times I went to visit Hebrew Union, uh, I shouldn't say this. This is bragging. 
But I wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's, it's just because that's just the nature of Dr. Wayne. No, well, he's just a nice guy. You just can't imagine. This man reads Acadian like I read English. And uh, went five or six years ago, spoke up at Milford, Ohio, and where I used to preach, and David Musgrave was getting his doctor uh, as their uh, preacher. And we went out to eat that Sunday afternoon with Dr. Weisberg. Took us out to eat at one then David and myself out to eat. And uh, when we got in the car, we rode in his car from Hebrew Union to the restaurant. He was buying our mail. He insisted on buying our mail. And uh, he says, do you recognize this? And I, I did. It was the paper I wrote for him in 1967 on LMR 147. And he said, I keep this on my shelf. And every time I teach LMR 147, I read your paper first. Well, that was a good PR job he did there. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just my knowledge of Acadian next to his knowledge. Uh, when I met him, he was 29. He came to Hebrew Union. He graduated with his PhD at age 28. He spent a year in Chicago in the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary. That's the Acadian, the main Acadian <coughs> English Dictionary. As assistant editor of Volume A, <laughs> and he had then come to Hebrew Union. He was 29. I was 32. <laughs> and we became very close friends and uh, had him for Elamarna tablets and for history and other things. But anyway, wonderful person, really is. And I think that picture that would float around, he's one of the professors in that picture, Dr. Uh, David Weisberg. But in any case, any case, uh, he had been reading Cadian for eight years at the time. And he said, I was just kind of getting so I could read the Alamarna tablets at sight. <laughs> well, you know, I had uh, I had equivalent about three years of Cadian. This was, he had eight years of Acadia, so you get, you get the idea. But in any case, these letters were written from Shubilulimash, different places, from Syria, from Assyria, all over Syria, from uh, Babylonia, uh, and they were written to the city of uh, Octaton. And he didn't last long there, and, and, and King Tut moved the kingdom back to Thebes moved the capital back to Thebes, and so it was a short-lived, and that's why the name Amarna is the modern-day name, and it was called Tel Al Amarna, and they had to finally drop, they're trying to get the word Tel out of the name because there's no Tel there. A tel is different levels of civilization. This is just one level. <laughs> All the ruins are just one level, you understand? And so that's why, but you'll see it, the books will say, uh, such and such and the Amarna tablet, such and such and the, they usually use Amarna because everybody knows that modern day name. That's the modern day name of the settlement. Well, these letters were written from all over the world, 380 we have found now. Let me sadly tell you what happened to some of the letters. When they were discovered by these peasants at Amarna, they put them in sacks and decided to take them to Cairo, which was good. And they tied them on the back of donkeys, but they put no cushion, no straw or anything in there. And as the donkeys moved, the tablets rubbed together, and many tablets rubbed off the writing, because it's a long way to Cairo. But those tablets we had of what they delivered, plus others been found, now amount to 380 or so. And they're, it's very, very easy to read the tablets, except the Akkadian, of course, from uh, these letters, the tablets are all written in Akkadian to the court in Egypt, not in hieroglyphs, not in any Egyptian language, because Akkadian had become the lingua franca of the ancient Near East at this point in time, and remained that until roughly Cyrus's cylinder. You may not realize it, but when Cyrus wrote his cylinder, he lived in a, a, a land of Persia, which used uh, Persian and uh, Elamite as uh, everyday languages. They used Aramaic as their diplomatic languages. But he wrote this Cyrus cylinder that freed everybody to go back home in Acadian. The 
because it was the Latin of the day. It was the Latin of the day. I think I may have told you way back in Sumer, when Akkadian was becoming dominant and Sumerian was disappearing a little bit, a Sumerian proverb was, a scholar who knows Akkadian, that's a good scholar for you. But a scholar who knows Sumerian, that's a real scholar for you. <laughs> that's one of the proverbs. <laughs> uh, and so it would be like, if I made a parallel, I'd say, well, what would it be like? Well, he came along, he wrote it in Latin. He wrote it in Latin in uh, 1985. They, they, they put up uh, a uh, inscription on this building and put it in Latin, which would be rare, rare today, would it not? But it wasn't rare 100 years ago. A little over 100 years ago, if you went to Harvard, you did send an application in unless you had four years of Latin and four years of Greek in high school. Do not even bother sending your application in. And about that time I found that out, I was teaching Greek in the morning early <coughs> in high school. I told my teacher to get started over there. And I kind of complained one day, what a shame it was, that I had four years of Latin but didn't offer Greek. And I was being a little critical, I think, and one of the students the next day brought me an 1896-97 Lipscomb catalog for the high school and the junior college. And they offered six years of Latin and eight years of Greek. They offered eight years of Greek. You started out with classical Greek. You read the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. You read the New Testament. You read the Church Fathers. And on and on and on. Eight years of Greek was offered. From that time on, I shut my mouth. <laughs> but I got them up to a semester with the introduction to biblical language with it. And, they, and after I could do that seven, I said, I can't do it anymore, then they're not doing it again. So, <laughs> so they're falling back. F.F. Uh, Bruce, when he uh, wrote his last book, Canon of Scripture, in the late 80s, early 90s, lamented over the dropping of Greek at the university where he taught. And he said uh, he hoped someday that the school would think it wise to replace the Greek they had axed. <laughs> in the front of his book. Oh, he put the date, axed on 1988 and hoped to be someday to be revived. He was broken hearted over Okay. Now, you get into the time of David, and what's happened uh, in Samuel, uh, Ruth, Samuel, that you're, you're, you're now looking around Israel. You're looking around. You're not reaching out to Babylon and Syria so much. You're now looking for things in the Moabite, like the Moabite stone, like the Dan Stila at the uh, city of Dan, the David Stila, Dan Stila. You're now looking for things, the Gezer calendar. You're looking for things in Palestine, especially. Lots of Aramaic, Aramaic monuments with uh, the Aramaic kings on them. And um, that takes you through First and Second Samuel. That's what you usually do when you're doing archaeology uh, in that period. By the time you get to kings, what's happened is the... Um, the Neo-Assyrian period has started, especially the divided kingdom. The Neo-Assyrian period has started, and suddenly you have a contact with Assyria, followed by contact with Babylonia, and that takes you through Kings, First and Second Kings, and Chronicles, and tons of minor prophets. One of the handouts I gave you last week, I guess it was, had on there the minor prophets in archaeology. And, and what are they talking about? They're talking about a Syrian invasion. They're talking about uh, the different kings coming down upon them. Okay, now, having done all that, having said that, we bring us to this. Now, how much time have I got right now? I've got five minutes right now. Okay. I know everybody doesn't have one. I hope we can share one if you don't have one. Uh, Alan, you don't have one, do you? 
I mean, Glenn, Glenn, you don't have one. Do you? Sometimes I call you Alan. Don't ask me why. Your alias Alan. But Glenn, what we do is pass this one to uh, Glenn, and I'll take the textbook. And like I said, at the end of the class tonight, we'll collect those. Oh, you got two. I tried to do one. Kind of okay. And then we'll give this back to you, though. Who, who doesn't have one or have access? Okay. Let me pass that behind you. And what we'll do is if all the church people will raise your hand and swear it hands yours in, <laughs> and I'll provide you one. I'll, I'll catch up with all of you, and we'll make sure the people are busy. Here's a book. <coughs> Obviously, <laughs> see how bright that boy is. There's a book called Documents from Old Testament Times. And, and again, I will try by next week. Uh, I'll be with you uh, next week. I'll get the door open. Uh, I'm at a dinner at the youth center. I'm introducing the speaker that I got for them at a quarter to seven. and then I'll, But I'll have this open already. And uh, you can come on in and I'll pop right back. Uh, Having a, uh, having a coach come and talk to them about coaching their way through life, you know, spiritual principles. Uh, coach Roller, Mike Roller. Okay. But I will try next week to have a big line for you, including the Lakish and stuff, and including Layard. Um, let me just, maybe I should take the five minutes to do that, talk about that, uh, and then we'll do these handouts as soon as we come back from the break. The, uh, best, it's hard to say what the best book is on lay art. Uh, and you don't have to jot the down, but I will bring you a list, I promise you, next week. But I got my beginning on the road to Nineveh. I didn't quite realize I bought it at Hebrew or some uh, place in Cincinnati. And I had read sections of it on lay art and uh, especially on, on Sennacherib. And then I had... Uh, learned a lot about the archaeology over at there and over the years. Kept on studying all the time about Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt, Hittites. But I had uh, forgotten about Layard. He had just kind of drifted out of my mind. I knew there was a book called The Luck of Nineveh. And I was walking down the hall. Did I tell the story the first night? I think I was walking down the hall. And one of the professors had books out for sale. And there was The Luck of Nineveh have a name in it. I didn't see his name anywhere. He just had a jar, said, put your money here, and it said one dollar. So I bought it. Uh, it was kind of a popular version of it. I went home that night, and I read it until four in the morning. And I did not stop. I started sometime in the evening and did not stop till I read the book. Next day, I went to, looked on the line, online and saw that they had Road to Nineveh, and they had one of Layard's original books was also in our library. And I was going to go get it, and I looked up and said, well, let me look at my, and there was Road to Nineveh. And pulled it off shelf, and it's all the whole Sennacherib section was underlined. And I began searching for books. And then, anyway, I have a pretty good-sized library now of them, thanks to friends, a couple of friends that donated uh, some of his books to me. But I've got some first editions of his books. He began writing in 1849, and uh, in any case, uh, the latest book came out in the 1990s was uh, uh, called The Conquest of Assyria. Uh, Doug and I had uh, met, already met with Disney, uh, working on uh, something and trying to get a, that movie going, and on the cover of this book, it looked like uh, Layard was Lawrence of Arabia turned out to be not Layard, it was one of the uh, Bedouin soldiers, uh, his men guarding one of the winged bulls that was sticking out of the sand. But it was dressed just like Lawrence of Arabia. <coughs> and then, you know, I found out that this man was like Indiana Jones and Lawrence of Arabia wrapped up in one, but his story was a true story. And of course, much of Lawrence of Arabia is, is, is a true story. Indiana Jones is probably made up. <laughs> uh, but still fascinating but anyway so I just read everything I could read on him read everything I could find on the internet anywhere on every book I could buy on Layard and uh, uh, in this book 
that came out in the 1990s is written by a very sophisticated scholar, a very serious scholar, excellent English, just very high level. But even he gets caught up in the romance. Because when Layard goes into the mountain, the Zagros Mountains, and ends up becoming friends with the Bakhtiari tribe and the, uh, the wonderful uh, outlaw sheep there, and that story I told you about saving the 10-year-old, when it comes to that chapter, he names it. This is so inconsistent with everything else this man has written or does, even in this book. But he's so caught up, he names that chapter Indiana Jones among the Bakhtiari. <laughs> <laughs> he just can't, and it's just, was beneath his dignity, but he just couldn't help it. So he still named the chapter Indiana Jones among the Bakhtiari, uh, which is the name of the tribe in the Zagros Mountains. Get close? Yeah, pretty close. Okay. Just now, in the last, we, we will spend our time on the other. Let me quickly, I know I step over here really find it quickly. In the last couple of minutes, I'll show you a couple of books. The Bible is History by Keller. This is a, a marvelous book uh, on archaeology in the Bible. And uh, it's written in very popular language by Warner Keller. This is the second edition. I, think, I don't know if it was the third or not. But for example, just uh, some of the, one quick story in this book, just show you how much you enjoy the book. Uh, when I teach uh, about Jonathan, Jonathan in chapters 13 and 14 of the book of 1 Samuel becomes a hero. He defeats the Philistines at a place called Michmash. And if you remember in the story, what happens, he was, um, at the foot of the mountain, foot of the hill, <coughs> with his armor bearer, his Naar, a little bitty boy, his armor bearer. <laughs> and he calls up the Philistines and he said, now, he prayed to God and he said, if these people say, you know, uh, wait down there for us, then he said, we need to, we need to split. If he says, come on up, we'll show you a thing or two, then God has delivered them into our hands. And, he, and the armor bearer said, he said, are you with me? And he said, I'm with you. And the Philistines, I'll come up, we'll show you a thing or two. They are encamped on top of the hill. Philistines are at war with Israel. It tells us that he went through, he and his armor bearer suddenly disappeared and went through two rocks called uh, Bozes. One rock is Bozes. The other rock, I won't tell you the name, I'll just say what it means. It means the molar, the big tooth. And they popped up on top of the mountain, if you remember in the story and caught the Philistines by surprise, and Jonathan slew them as they came to him, and the armor bearer finished them off. So he was not a little bitty boy. His job was to finish them off. And of course, if the, if, uh, the knight wasn't wounded enough for him to handle him, he yelled, you know, come on, boss, come here, boss, come back, boss. <laughs> if the boss couldn't come back, he was in trouble. But anyway, that's what happened. The British were fighting the Turks, he tells you the story. And one of the, I think he was a major, but I can't remember, I think it's a major. I said, Micmash, Micmash, I know that's in the Bible. And he didn't have a concordance, so he read and read and read until he came across 1 Samuel 13 and 14. Took it to his commander, woke him up in the middle of the night, showed him that. They took a group of soldiers out, British soldiers, looking, and they found the two rocks in a passageway between the two rocks. <laughs> and they caught the Turks by surprise, using exactly the same tactics that Jonathan used, this Indian language now, many, many moons before. <laughs> okay. that's, that's, what, is that the end of the, okay. Pretty near, yeah. Pretty near? Yeah. I got another second. I got a second. <laughs> this is by Alan Millard, who was the keynote speaker that I told you in Louisville. Alan Millard. This would be our textbook, but it's out of print. It first came out as, as uh, treasures from Bible times, but it has only a page or two on everything. Uh, here is about Assyria and about Layard, and it has a couple of pages, no more than usually two, and then it'll go to another topic. Uh, here's uh, that's Pritchard there deciphering. Here is the uh, the mystery of hieroglyphs, like about four pages, and it goes through the Bible like this. With the history of inscription, this is what Rawlingson 
uh, squeezed and brought to Layard, and they worked and finally deciphered Akkadian from that. And it's a marvelous book, Digging the Past. And everything is just two or three pages. When Sir Leonard Woolley's wife came to investigate what he found, the, the silk he had found there in the big pit, <coughs> he wondered, well, could this be the flood? And her famous statement is, of course it's the flood. And that made the headlines of the British newspapers. <laughs> and that was a question on one of those 250, 300, whatever number of questions I said. That was one of the questions. What did Sir Leonard Woolley's want to say? <laughs> and, and see, the tests, my tests are a little different from this PhD class. They had to answer the test in one color, and then they did the best they could, and then they came back in, in another color, and then they get to go back and correct their mistakes and answer again. And they can use any source they want to use. They can use their notes, my notes, they can use textbook, they can go to the internet. And it's a really interesting <laughs> procedure. So when the test comes, it comes in two colors. What they knew off the top of their head and, you know, what they what they had. And what happens is this, of course, they'll ne about half of them miss this. They'll never forget this. And I pointed out where it was in the notes and I pointed out, you know, even, uh, even in uh, one of the books they had, but this is the Babylon story of the flood. It's a, it's a beautiful book, it's a wonderful book, but it's out of print. It's called uh, Illustrated Wonders and Discoveries of the Bible by Alan Millard, M-I-L-L-A-R-D. If you run across a copy in the used bookstore, you need the Bible Treasures, which is the shorter version. It's got Old and New Testament. I think it's got some intertestamental things here too. But uh, like there's New Testament, there's Capernaum, right there, the synagogue of Capernaum that many of you have been in. It's just, uh, you know, it's just, uh, our, here's, uh, this is what we always see first. We go to Caesarea, and there's a replica there now. The real one's in the British Museum. For a long time, the, the real one was there, and I kept saying, why are they leaving this out in the rain? But it's in the British Museum, and it says, uh, it has two names on there you'd be interested in knowing about, Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate. Um, they're in Latin, they're in Latin. Okay, we'll take our break. I'm going to use uh, this, the text, and I uh, hope you've got one to, to look at. Uh, I do apologize for the machine breaking down on me. I just sort of, uh, started sooner. I was just had some deadlines that I was trying to meet. Uh, but anyway, I'm starting in this book on page 40. Six. You ought to have page 46 as your front page. Now, usually I think these things out and I take the hand out. Before you hand out just a second. And I take the hand out, and of course I want to do front and back, uh, and I make sure that, you know, that it works out. Well, but I forgot to do that, and it still works out. If you turn it up, you get the right thing. I want to tell you that was an accident. And after they were being about 20 had been run off, I said, oh, no grab one real quick and usually look at the first one. I'm so pressed for time. Okay. These, these are translations. There have been some new translations made recently. But these are translations. That, this book is so handy because it's not an expensive book. Uh, I'll just look and see if I can see the price. This was probably $9.95 because I've had it a long, long time. <laughs> but I think I've seen them for... 1995 or 27, but anyway, it's still available. Documents from Old Testament times. Dewitt and Thomas is the editor, but this is the the handiest book available. There is a standard book the students use called a net, ancient Near Eastern text, and then colon. It has a big long title about being parallel parallel text to the Old Testament. And it's strictly Old Testament, <coughs> and this is strictly Old Testament. There is a brand new workout called the Context of Scripture. Three big, giant paperback volumes. Best price, $160 for the three paperback. Regular price, $300 and something dollars. Even, I think, for the paperback goes high. It is done, most interestingly, Clyde Miller is a close friend of mine, taught it with me at Lipscomb a long, long time, did a lot of his doctor work at Hebrew Union. 
his Hebrew professor was a name, man named William Hallow, who went from Hebrew Union to Yale and became a very famous Hebrew Akkadian scholar and ancient Near Eastern scholar. And uh, Dr. Weisberg, I mentioned to you a while ago, uh, had him for many classes. Uh, he, in the last several years, has uh, teamed up with some conservative people and uh, about the reliability of the finds in this uh, period of time. And he edited this with a man named Lawson Younger, who was one of the speakers at Louisville, and I told you about going up there and having the seminar on the ancient areas in the Bible, the Old Testament, verifying the Old Testament. And Dr. Younger has become one of the top Assyrian young scholars, no pun intended his name. He's probably in his early 50s, and uh, he's just been, well, he's the other editor, just showing his status. It's hollow and, and younger, lost and younger. And this is a new work that if you put all three of them together, they're about this thick. And they have new translations of things, and, and some of the, even the old text they've come along, and since we now know more and more and more. But this is a wonderful book, and uh, this is what we started out reading when you had Akkadian, or you had Hittite, or, or, or any of those kind of languages, you start out reading campaigns. And the, at Hebrew Union, at some schools, you start out reading them in, in English. That is, they give you, they'll have uh, Enuma, Elish, something, and you, you have English, Enuma, Elish. They don't have the Kinetic form. And they just want you to get used to the Akkadian and the verb structure and begin learning nouns and things like that. But Hebrew Union wouldn't let you do it. That was the, that was the chicken way to do it. That was, <laughs> that was the kindergarten way. You start out with a cuneiform text. And you have, to, you have to start reading right off the bat. You just have to learn what those symbols are and pronounce anuma, anuma, elish. And that's the way you did it. But we started with campaigns. And in Hittite, we started with the campaigns of Shubilulumash. And in uh, Akkadian, we started with uh, campaigns of people like Tiglath-Pileser and Shalmaneser III. So anyway, this is the kind of thing that we read. And, and what's amazing here is, you see, this, when they found these, how excited they were. I departed from Aleppo. Well, Aleppo, this is the city where uh, Layard caught up with Bedford. Bedford waited for him at Aleppo. It's in Syria, and then it starts mentioning towns, and some of these towns appear in the Bible. Now drop down, this is Shalmaneser III. He ruled from 859, uh, I underlined on the left-hand side, eight, actually 858 is the date I give it, because 824. He was the one of the, he was the son of the first palace that Layard found. When Layard hit the palace of his father, Asher Nassau II. Uh, the next king was Shalmaneser III, and in his courtyard he found this beautiful six and a half foot black obelisk that we've looked at with a picture of Jehu. The only picture we have of a Jewish king so far. We have one picture in ancient times of a Jewish king. That's Jehu on that black obelisk. This is Shalmaneser writing. Uh, about five lines out, I departed from Argana and drew near to Karkar. Well, what's interesting about Karkar is he tells us, he's the first king that tells us about coming in contact with a Hebrew or Israeli. And he said, uh, and then demolished, destroyed, and burned down Karkar, his royal residence of the king he's talking about. 1,200 chariots, 1,200 cavalry horsemen, 20,000 men belonging to Adad Idri. That's another name for Ben Hadad. There were about three or four Ben Hadads. And one is named, you know, the, the Adad is the same as Hadad. East Semitic is Adad, Akkadian. West Semitic is Hadad. That's the storm god. Adad and Hadad. And uh, anyway, of Damascus. And if you remember in the Bible, what was. Ben Hadad's the center of his kingdom, Damascus in the Bible. And that Damascus is still there today, by the way. Remember, it's the New Testament city, 
Paul of Tarsus went to Damascus, and remember that? Went to Straight Street. Uh, when we go to the Golan Heights, we try to go to the United Nations buildings. Did you, I know you've been there. Did you go to the United Nations building? And uh, did you, Paul, Pauline, have you been to the United Nations building? You are, then I ask people, how far do you think we are from Damascus? And they'll say, oh, 50, 60 miles. Well, you're about 25 miles from Damascus right there where you are. <laughs> Just down that road right there. We never get any takers, but anyway, <laughs> time just turn left and go right there. Mm -hmm. I actually can't get across the border. <clears throat> but you're in occupied uh, Syrian, ter Syrian territory at that point. Well, these people, Karkar is in Syria, and here's the king of Damascus, 700 chariots, 700 cavalry, 10,000 men, so also of this uh, other guy whose name is Irulina, 2,000 now. For some reason, D. Witt and Thomas translated 200. He just couldn't believe that it's 2,000. The Cadian says 2,000. Everybody else translates it 2,000. It just was beyond his comprehension. Now, <laughs> scholars shouldn't do that. <laughs> there is a passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah has been thrown in the pit by people who had gone to King Zedekiah and said, we don't like Jeremiah. He's causing all kinds of problems. We want to throw him in the cistern. The king said, go ahead. What have we got to lose? The city's about to fall. Oh, the, you know, and then he throws, has him thrown in the cistern. There was a fan of his named Abi Melik. Uh, not Abi Melik. Uh, he's got a metal block on his name. It's not, it's, uh, hmm. I may have to get a Bible out and look. can't believe it. I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, oh, it's, it's from Abi Melik. That's what it is. It's... Uh, it means the servant of the king. His name actually means Ebed Melek. It's the way that we do it in English is E-B-E-D. In Hebrew it's Ebed. We say Ebed. So let's just call it Ebed. It means the servant of the king. So we don't know if that was his name or if that was his title. That's our problem. But Ebed Melek or Ebed Melek comes uh, from the verb, uh, from the noun uh, Ebed. Uh, and he's says to Zedekiah, this is a terrible thing to do. I want to get him out. So he says, okay. So it says he took with him, according to the New English Bible and the RSV, three men. Jeremiah, meanwhile, had been sunk down in the mud. There was no water left, but there was mud sunk down in the mud. And they threw him down, according to the King James Version, some old class clouts to put under his armholes. <laughs> 1611. Old class clouts of rags. It was the word for rags in 1611. And armholes was what we call armpits. Armhole, that's a pretty good name. I remember Dory and I were playing with him one day, and he took this doll and pulled his arm out, and I said, oh, that's an armhole, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, smells a lot better than armpit. But anyway, <laughs> they threw it out. He put these old rags under his armpits, and they pulled him out. Now, the RSV and the New English Bible says they took three men. Hebrew doesn't say that at all. Hebrew says 30 men. All translations, but those two that I know of, say 30 men. They just couldn't believe it would take 30 men to pull a journal out. That's not the job of the translator. He's supposed to translate what's there. Only one manuscript says three men. All other manuscripts say 30. And the truth of the matter was it was 30 men. He needed two or three or four men to pull him out. He needed the rest to guard them while they pulled him out because they didn't want Jeremiah out of that pit. The people would have probably thrown those three plus Ebed Melech into the pit. So you only give the correct exegesis if you have the correct translation. And, and they did not translate correctly there. Why do I say that? Well, because here comes a guy. He decides... Ahab couldn't have had 2,000 chariots. <laughs> that was more chariots than all of his allies. Had to That's true. If you add all the allies up, you'll have Ahab has more chariots. When I'm doing my dissertation, though, I spent a lot of time on Ahab's chariots and found out that now we assign at, at Megiddo and in several other cities, we assign those chariot cities, uh, which originally were Solomon's, but what has been dug up and what is 
facing you and what you see are Ahab's stalls and Ahab's chariot horses, verifying he had a massive number of chariots. And he had a great chariot soldier under him named Jehu, who was one of the speediest drivers around. Remember it says he dry, drove like a madman? They're looking from the Gideon ahead. Who, who's coming? I, I don't know, but whoever is driving, well, he drives like Jehu. <laughs> like a madman. And it's the same word used when Jehu is anointed before he does this. He's anointed by one of the prophets, sons of the prophets, sent by, uh, sent by uh, the prophet of Israel. And uh, when he goes inside and anoints this guy and then goes out, the other generals say to Jehu, what did that madman want? It's exactly the same word used of how he drove. <laughs> it's exactly the same Hebrew word. Talk about it. He drove like a madman, wild man. And uh, anyway, there's just now a tremendous amount of archaeological evidence showing you that 2,000 was the correct. This is the only guy that puts 200. Everybody else puts 2,000. Of course, you saw it has 2,000 in your text, but I wrote put a zero in there. Because the Akkadian says 2,000. It doesn't say 200. <coughs> so, anyway. Uh, and 10,000 men of Ahab the Israelite, the very first Hebrew king mentioned in ancient records, Ahab. M m uh, earlier, in, maybe, until, that was until 1993 when we found David's name. <laughs> he was the earliest king of the divided monarchy found, was Ahab. But here he is in all his glory. And uh, anyway, it tells about uh, the battle that goes on. Okay, turn the page. Uh, page 48, the top. He, he tells in his 18th regnum year uh, that he had crossed, he had crossed the uh, Euphrates again for the 16th time. Haziel of Aram put his trust in the numerical strength of his army. Ahab doesn't join this group, but there is Haziel now. And if you remember the Bible, who was it that succeeded um, Ben-Hadad? Haziel. Haziel murdered him. Remember, Elisha wept over that and predicted, you will murder your master. Why would he do that, he said? And then he goes home and does it. He goes home and murders uh, his master. Well, a most interesting thing, let's see if it has it, if it, has it right here, if it's in another text. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, I should have it marked somewhere, but I don't see it right now. But anyway, I'll, I'll tell you about it, and maybe we'll run across it. Haziel is called, in one of the texts, and we may run across it, the son of nobody. Why was he called the son of nobody? That was the Akkadian expression for usurper. And he had killed Ben-Hadad. He calls Jehu the son of Omri. He appears at the, this is the black obelisk, down the middle of the page, and that I received the tribute of the people of Tyre, Sidon, and of Jehu, son of Omri. Who founded, this is a, this is a trick question, who's buried in grass tomb? Who founded the Amri dynasty? <laughs> Amri. What was his son's name? Ahab. Amri is only has a few verses about him in the Bible. About eight, I think, if I remember correctly. Eight or ten, small number. But a ton about Ahab. But Amri built a palace, bought the hill that became the city of Samaria. I have been there just one time. We were allowed to go there a couple of times, but we decided to only go once. And went there one time. And you can still see the palace. They actually found the palace with ivory in it. And it says in the Bible, I'm going to mark all those passages and just uh, decide it take too long to, to, to go through the Bible with you. But it talks about when Ahab dies, the <coughs> ivory palace in the Bible. And here this palace we found had ivory in it. Okay? And um, anyway, uh, Jehu is called the son of Omri. Well, we know he wiped out the Amre dynasty. The Assyrians didn't know that. Remember, you didn't have papers coming out of Israel and newspapers and 
you didn't have TV and you have all that stuff, and so they got their face. They knew Hazel, who was much closer to them. Hazel, see, Syria was right next door to us, Syria, and they knew that Hazel or Hazel had murdered his master, so he is called the son of nobody. But they didn't know that Amri had wiped out, I mean, that Jacob wiped out the Amri dynasty, so he is still called the son of Amri, and then when they refer to the people of Israel and to the land of Israel, it is called Bit Amri, the house of Amri. It's still called the house of Amri, not knowing the house of Amri has fallen. So the Assyrian scribes were, you know, they you couldn't keep up with everything, so they didn't know that it happened. But isn't that interesting, you see? Uh, now there's a guy who wrote in Bar, Biblical Archives Review, an article insisting that Jehu was actually uh, actually of Amri's house in a different line, and he wiped out his competitors. And so that article is, is sounded like a guy was trying to find something to write on. But anyway, the point is, that's the view. That's the view that this guy held. The point is, he said, oh, the Syrians knew he was the son of Amri. He really was the son of Amri. But He's not called that in the Bible. So he, simply they called him that by mistake. Okay. Uh, then it shows the, uh, the tribute of him. And then, uh, see the translation is Ahab the Israelite, back on the page before. But that's the translation that, that we stuck in there, that the guy stuck in there. It actually it uses a word of what they call, they call the land of Israel, uh, uh, Sir Laa at that time. Then they started calling it that. They were also called the House of Amr. Okay. Now, if you will, we go to uh, Adad Narari's expedition, 803. And uh, that's on page uh, 50. Adad Narari is a king down the line from Shalmaneser. He's a, later on there will be a king. Uh, this is during a, uh, getting ready to have a weak period, but he's still strong. Look what he says on page 51, right in the middle where I got the star there. He talks about the different places. The Great Sea is the Mediterranean, uh, the Great Sea of the Rising Sun, uh, from the districts above the Euphrates. Hatti land, Hatti. See the word Hatti land? Mm -hmm. That means Hittite land. The name for Hitti, Hittite country was Hatti, H A T T I. But what happened was a large chunk of Palestine was now called Hatti land or Hittite land because in the Amarna letters and the letters connected with that, we found out that the queen of uh, one of the queens of, uh, of the murdered, whether it was King Tut or the next king got murdered, one of the queen's husband got murdered, and she sent a message to Shubilulumai saying, if you will send me one of your sons, I will marry him, and you, Shubi, can rule Egypt too. And he didn't believe her. So he did not send the son until his men persuaded him weeks later. And it was true. She was trying to marry a Hittite prince and be under the umbrella of Shubi. And when the son crossed the Egyptian border, he was assassinated. And Shubi brought his army and kept captured much of Syria and Palestine. And for a long time, it was called the land of the Hittites. Is that in the Bible? You, as I tell my students, you bet your sweet grave it is. God says at the beginning of Joshua, I will give you the land of the Hittites from the great river of Euphrates to the river of Egypt, which was the, a, a river that runs just south of Gaza Strip. The brook of Egypt, the one the Nile. And so there it is in the Bible, the land of the Hittites. And so he talks about here, Hatti land, the land of the Hittites. Amorite land, remember the Amorites? We didn't know a thing about the Amorites until we started digging things up. Look at the cities. Are these the Bible? Tyre, Sidon, Israel. There's Israel. Edom, Philistia. <laughs> you see that? Places in the Bible. As far as the great sea of the setting sun, the Mediterranean. Two lines later. I marched to Aram. Aram was the Old Testament name, an ancient name for Syria. It was called Aram. In New Testament times, it took on the name Syria. That was the name that the Romans gave it as a province. Modern times called Syria. 
So the English translations always just try to fight where they should put Arameans and Aram or put Syrians in Syria. So they, they put Syria in Syria so people can know where it is. They put Aram and Arameans to be more accurate. So it's always that battle, what to do. What to do. <coughs> I marched to Aram and shut up Mari, king of Aram. There was a king named Mari. There used to be a city. In Damascus' <coughs> capital, the awful splendor of the god Asher. Well, why shouldn't he have a god named Asher? That's where the name of Syria came from. That was the first major city. That was a city that Layard excavated only a little bit. He excavated mostly Nimrud. And by the way, I, I meant to say this to you. As we come across these tablets, uh, the names of the tablets, well, look at the bottom of the page. The Nimrud slab inscription from the big 300-acre hill of Nimrud, where the city of Kala was found, the capital of Shalmaneser III, uh, Tiglath-Pileser, and all. This king here, a whole list of kings uh, were there now. Uh, anyway, he tells uh, what he said, 23,000 talents of silver, 20,000 of gold, 300,000 of copper, 5,000 talents of iron. So, and then all the individual rulers of Kaladu land expressed their submission. Now, this is most interesting because uh, this also becomes later, this is where the, from the Chaldeans, they moved down to the south, but at this time they were here in the north. And out, and out of the Chaldeans came Nebuchadnezzar and the boys. Okay? Well, the next one mentions, uh, mentions the land of Philistia. We'll move on, and you'll turn to page 53. If I did 53, 40, I think I did. Interventions of Tiglath Pileser III in Syria and Palestine. <coughs> Tiglath Pileser is the first Assyrian king mentioned in the Bible. Ahab comes into contact, and Jehu comes into contact with um, Shalmaneser the third, but Shalmaneser the third is not mentioned in the Bible. But they they come in contact with him. But those battles are not recorded. Every battle couldn't be recorded. Oh, I, I do need to tell you this. We learn so much. It's just incredible how much we learn from these stories. When you see Ben Hadad also known as uh, Adad Idri, and Ahab fighting against Assyria, it helps you understand a story that made no sense to us for a long time. In the end of 1 Kings, you have some chapters there which <coughs> Ahab and Ben Hadad are always fighting each other. They're always at war. And in one of those chapters, <coughs> Ahab captures Ben Hadad. And uh, Ben-Hadad is afraid and sends a message to him and asks him basically, what is my brother going to do? And Ahab sent a message back saying, well, I wouldn't harm my brother. Brother was an ancient Near Eastern term for ally. What happened was, whenever the Assyrians were not a threat, they fought each other. When the Assyrians came over, they joined together and fought as allies. When the Assyrians went home, they fought each other. <laughs> <laughs> and that explained the story that we did not understand. We didn't understand how can they call each other brother, allies, when we didn't know they were allies, and we did found out through ancient history outside the Bible. But the Bible again left out and got it right. So they were there. Okay. Now, anyway, Tiglath Pileser. Boy, does he have contact with everybody's brother. Look on page 54. He tells you there that. Uh, he received tribute from uh, Azariah. Well, Akkadian has to have the U ending for a certain reason for these names. But that's Azariah, who was another name for Uzziah. And uh, Yaudi is the name for Judah. You say, what? Well, doesn't sound like Judah. Well, guess what the Hebrew name is? It's Yehudi. <coughs> Yehuda is the name of the city. Yehudi is a Judah. So, the Hebrew name and the Akkadian name are almost identical. And the Y evolved into a J. The Shiva dropped out in English well, along with the H and leaves you with the, the D and the English. It's all kinds of spellings. So just think about the name Judah. What, take a name Judah, not just the city of the uh, country of Judah. Take a name Judah. What's Judah's Greek form? Judas. What's the Greek name form? Jude. <laughs> so you got Judah, Greek form Judas, short form Jude. All those names appear in the Bible. You see? If you're in the Old Testament, you get Judah. In the New Testament, you get Judas. 
One simply the Greek, one's Hebrew. And Judah is the short name. Don't forget Judith. Pardon me? Judith. And of course you got a female name, Judah. Uh, who didn't like those guys anyway? No, a little bit. Anyway, that's that's true. You have uh, you have so many connections. Like in my family, everybody's named uh, Michael or Michelle. It's, it's Michelle, Juanita is my son's wife, and then David is David Michael, and his son is Duncan Michael. So they are all they all have the same Michael Michelle name. I knew that was going to be a big hit. Okay, all right. Take last, please. What's his name in the kingdom? He's, he's uh, well, it's just too big. It's just a big, long name. <coughs> what happens is it comes out as Tiglath Pileser, going through Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and English. It finally comes out, Tiglath Pileser. But look at some of the people, bottom of the page, underlined there. He talks about receiving tribute from a risen of Damascus. Is there a risen in the Bible? Yes, he is. He's one of the kings of Damascus in the Bible. Menahem of Samaria. Is there a king named Menahem? You bet your sweet grave. There's a student, a guy named Menahem, and he receives tribute. Hiram of Tyre, the reason that Hiram has a bracket around him, that's chipped off. We can only read part of that. We think it's probably Hiram, but we're not really sure. And on and on and on. In these cities, Biblos, in the Amarna letters, there are 60 letters written from the city of Biblos to Egypt. 60 letters. The guy must have had nothing else to do but write letters. <laughs> 60 letters. Parchamesh, Hamath, all these, I mean, so many of these are cities, you know, we know from the Bible. Then there's the black obelisk you see on the right-hand side. Turn the page, page 55. Uh, he mentions places, look, just to show you, uh, he's talking about these cities, because they're on the border of Israel, uh, in the territory of Damascus. And Damascus is called, here in this text, Bit Chazili, that is the house of Haziel. What it's called. At the bottom of the page, he talks about Israel. I received Israel, Bit Humri. Bit is like Beth in Hebrew. House of Omri. Still call, still call it the House of Omri, even though Omri is long gone. Uh, the total of its inhabitants together with the possession, I let off the Assyria. Pekah, their king, they disposed, and Hosea, I set up. What order do you have in the Bible? You have Pekah, followed by Hosea. Just a it's a, just an exact parallel of the Bible. There is no difference in the information. And that's called the Nimrod, the Nimrud tablet. The Nimrud tablet. So you know where it comes from, the big mound of Nimrud. Page 56, look at some of the people mentioned. Talks about uh, Moab, the city. Talks about the city of Ashkelon. Talks about Jehoahaz of Judah. What do you suppose the name of the king was at this time? Jehoahaz was one of the kings of Judah, uh, also known as Ahaz. And then the city of Gaza. That's the place is still with us today, Gaza. So just place after place after place, you see, is, is mentioned. If you'll, and so uh, the kings just are exactly the right order. At the bottom of page 57, he's discussing an Assyrian title, the Rab Sheku, the Rab Shaku. That was a high official. Rab means chief. And... Uh, uh, comes into Hebrew as uh, the Rob Shekin. That's in the time of, uh, of uh, Sennacherib and the time of Nebuchadnezzar. You have these guys called uh, Rob, uh, in fact, Second Sennacherib is referring to in Isaiah. It's actually the Rob Shaku. That's a title actually found in the records. That's just not made up. Page 58, Sargon comes along. You say, well, you know, it's nice to mention these kings' names, but here's the king that doesn't occur in the Bible, Sargon. Well, that's not true. He appears in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. King Sargon, we know him to be Sargon II now. And we have found his annals. His brother was the, his brother or the king over him, Shalmaneser V. We have very few records of him. He only ruled five years. He took over for his dad, Tiglath Pileser, in 727, and then. He died somewhere around 722, and Sargon took over. We do not know if Sargon was his brother, one of his generals. Sargon didn't like him. We do know that. So uh, uh, we just don't have one animal of Shalmaneser V, but if we find one, I'm sure he'll tell about what's going on. 
here he just calls uh, Sargon II his successor, claims to be the conqueror of Samaria. So a lot of people doubt that. There's no reason to doubt it. He laid siege to the city for a year, then part of the year, a whole year, part of the year. He probably died, and Sargon took over, and then Sargon took all the credit. Naturally, the city fell while Sargon was king, so who's going to put their name on the monuments? Now, this is the series of tablets here that have the number of people. Now, most interesting, these scribes, it's funny how when, when uh, we look at biblical text, if there's any difference in Chronicles and Kings, they go crazy, see there? Look at that, it shows the Bible's not inspired. And yet, these Assyrian kings can have four or five different stela, sometimes nine, like the city of Jerusalem, when it was surrounded by Sennacherib, and they can all differ, the number and everything else, and they say, well, you see, what you have to draw from that is actually, they actually were there. That's what you have to draw. But if it's the Bible, and they'll take, they'll take a tablet from anybody outside the Bible as almost the word, if they only had one tablet, they said, this is the word of God. Uh, if it contradicted the Bible, different than the Bible, they say, well, this is right and the Bible's wrong. But here are all these tablets, I mean, these steel are side to side, and some of them say 27,290. Some of them say uh, he equipped 50 chariots. Others say 27,280. Others say something a little different. But the point is, two of them say 50 chariots. Uh, anyway, the point is, you can tell by looking at them all together. From the display inscription, Nimrod prison, he said all around he had a, even had annals on page 61, which goes to the bottom of page with the bottom of page 60, conquered Samaria and the whole land of Israel, which is full of the cities of Ashdod. Interesting, he mentioned the city of Ashdod because Isaiah 21 <coughs> mentions him being at Ashdod. That's the only time Sargon occurs, Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, and he's at Ashdod. And he tells that he's Ashdod right here. Another place for the Bible like that. A little humor there. Okay, <laughs> you get the idea? And so you just go through these, you just see king after king, place after place, the mention. Uh, he tells you on page 61, I, Sargon, true ruler, respectful of the pronouncements of Nabu and Marduk. Who were Nabu and Marduk? Marduk was the chief god of Babylonia. His Hebrew spelling is Morodach. Evil Morodach is the king that follows Nebuchadnezzar. It didn't mean he was a bad guy. It turns out he was a good guy. Uh, it means in Akkadian, man of Marduk. Uh, man of Marduk was his name. He's the guy that took Jehoiachin out of jail and let him eat the king's table. He'd been in jail 37 years and lifted him out of jail and let him eat. But unfortunately, he didn't last long. His, bro his brother-in-law assassinated him and became king. But anyway, Nabu is the son of Marduk. He is the god of writing. A lot of the kings got involved in scholarly works king named Nabonidus loved the arts. And his name, Nabonidus, begins with Nabu. Nebuchadnezzar begins with Nabu. His god was the god of writing, Nabu. Okay, you get the idea. Page 62, I conquered and spoiled the towns of this town, one of them is Samaria, the whole of Israel. Annals at Corsaba. Who found Corsaba? A guy named Paul Bota, friend of Laon. First city of Syrian city found, he found Khorsabad, which was 10 miles north of the city of Mosul and Nineveh, modern Mosul, Nineveh, and he found the palace of Sargon, and much of it ended up in the Louvre, because he was working, Italian man working for the French. When Layard went, uh, made his discoveries and went back home, he went back through Paris, and since he spoke fluent Italian and fluent French, Bota arranged for him to speak to the French Academy, which he did, and wowed them. He wowed them. Not only could they speak fluent French, they could follow what he was saying, but because of the discoveries, which were more outstanding than Bota's, which was pretty outstanding. But Bota found his first winged bull. He said, we couldn't possibly get this back to Paris without chopping it up. So he cut it into four pieces and just killed Layard. <laughs> But now if you go in the Louvre and look at it, you can't tell it was ever split up. They did a magnificent job of gluing it back together. <laughs> when the Layard refused to do that and, all, and almost lost some of them because he refused to. And one rack was loaded with these winged bulls. 
and it's going down the river, and uh, all of a sudden it turns and goes down a, a small one the river and takes off, and it's gone. And uh, Captain Jones, there was a guy named Captain Jones, believe it or not, not the, not the one we know of, but Captain Jones risked his life and tracked it down with his steamboat, and caught up with it and saved it. And it's in the British Museum now, but it almost met a, its death. Uh, Layard himself decided he would go to Babylon and take a look, and he was supposed to meet Captain Jones uh, at a certain time, and he got away late. He just kept staying there, kept staying, kept staying, and he got away late, lost his horse, whatever happened, and he uh, he got to the uh, Euphrates, uh, the Tigris, and saw the boat leaving, and Jones had waited and waited and waited, and he uh, running through the marshes and all, and uh, anyway, got it over his head and got really tired, and the next thing you know, he was drowning, and he was yelling, just yelling, and nobody was hearing him, and finally, somebody saw a hand way up there, and Jones turned around and was lay hard and rescued him, he almost drowned. He was too far out to go back, and he just was exhausted, and uh, anyway, plucked him out one of his many nine lives. He had, he had nine <laughs> lives, I promise you. What year would that have been? Yeah, that would have been, uh, that would have been like 1848, 49. I think that's, he first dug 1845 at Nimrud, a couple of years. Started digging at Nineveh a little bit. Finally came, went to England, came back, started dug at Nineveh. And he decided he wanted to dig some at Asher, and he wanted to uh, find Babylon. And so he went down to look, surveyed the ruins at Babylon. And he felt like he was in the right place, and he was, because they found a tower called the Tower of Nimrod. <laughs> and the Bible says Nimrod built the city of Babylon, too, as well as the city of Nineveh and Kala. Okay. Uh, in the, uh, on page 62, he says, Palace of Sargon. Uh, the subjugator of the land of Judah, which is far off, uprooter of Hamath, and so on and so forth. So that's it, on Nimrod building. So all these tablets, uh, it's unbelievable. And a lot of tablets have been translated, some more and more are translated. Then Sennacherib, I know our time is getting away from us, but Sennacherib, if you'll turn to page 67. But as for Hezekiah, the Jew who did not bow in submission to, to my yoke, 46 of his strong wall towns and innumerable smaller villages in the neighborhood I besieged and conquered by stamping down earth ramps and then by bringing up Babylon ramps and so forth. I, I made come out from them 200,000, 200, 150 people, young and old, male and female, a few lines down. He himself, Hezekiah, I shut up like a caged bird uh, within Jerusalem, his royal city. So... This is his discussion about him. He mentions Ashdod, mentions a king called Pati, uh, Padi rather, mentions Gaza, mentions Hezekiah again. And uh, anyway, uh, that's on what is known as nine different inscriptions. Uh, there, I think there are eight or nine stela, Jerusalem stela, the Taylor stela, the Serval stela, and this was on a bull inscription written on the side of a bull. Um, and you see he also has it on Nineveh and Navi Yunus. What's Navi Yunus? That's the, the prophet Jonah. On the mound called Prophet Jonah, they found a slab inscription, and it talks about, I overthrew the wide district of Judah. I imposed my yoke rope upon Hezekiah as king. So, get the idea? Uh, there's a section about mentioning Lachish here, how he conquered Lachish. It's amazing in the Bible it tells you that he was stationed at a place called Lachish or Lachish. We go there two or three times. It's on the next trip. I love to go there, especially when the British Museum is open. I hope it's going to be open again when we go. It was closed two years ago for three years, they said. Of course, they're building a brand new wing that will house Israeli archaeology only. And it was already a fascinating wing, but this is supposed to be even more fascinating. Hopefully, it'll be open by uh, by December or January. Love it open by January. Um, but they are uh, in this wing. You have a section of Lakeish, 
It's a replica from the British Museum. Um, Mac and Paula have been to the British Museum. There's a room called the Lakeish Room, roughly 60 feet. I guess this room would be this room would be a little more narrow than this room. Yes, yeah, there. And probably not as long, right? Yeah, that's about as long. Maybe it's long, but even a little more narrow. Mm -hmm. But on the walls, they have put what they found in Sennacherib's palace. Layard had no idea what that was. It turned out to be the destruction of the city of Lachish, showing you first they're attacking the city and the, they're shooting in and the guys are shooting out and then, then they got their siege machines and they got their picks and they're pounding on it and then you got uh, uh, the city falling and you got people having their heads chopped off, piles of heads, you got people tied to, to ropes and their skins being filleted off of them. You got Sennacherib on his throne. Now, I'll tell you a very fascinating story. The British Museum has a book showing you this picture. Of, in fact, well, this is Hammurabi. This is Hammurabi receiving the law code from the sun god. Um, but it says in the British Museum's handbook, probably the reason the face of Sennacherib has been destroyed is because of the Babylonian and their allies, the soldiers that came in probably just whacked his head off and his, the rosettas off his sleeve. They were a sign of royalty. That's not true. That's just false. How do I know that? Because Layard drew his face and all of the rosettas, all the little roses on his uh, royal throne, his, his robe. He put them all there. And Layard only drew what he saw. And what happened was it probably got destroyed on the way uh, because they would go from uh, Basra, they shipped them from, uh, from uh, Assyria to Baghdad, to Basra, out to the ocean, to Bombay. They would sit on the uh, pier for six months. British citizens would come and break open the crates and take what they wanted. Uh, and uh, Layard finally got that stopped and they got a law passed about that. <coughs> And uh, anyway, things actually sat there like the black obelisk for six months on the pier. And uh, could have all been lost. So some that were lost, things were damaged. They mixed up all with signs. They had all everything, all with signs on them, and they had those mixed up. <laughs> but he had become so famous that they, they cracked down on that. But anyway, some way or another, probably fell over, or people, you know, like the Sphinx. Uh, French soldiers just used it. That's target, target practice. They just you know, shot holes in it. And in Petra, they shot that beautiful top. They shot because they thought there was probably gold in those things. And so they would shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, trying to break them open and put lots and lots of uh, dents and holes in it. Layard's face is on what I gave you the first week. And that's what, La I mean, not Layard, but Sennacherib. And that's what he saw. He only drew, when he was trained to draw what he saw. And so the British Museum booklet makes no sense there. How did Layard, did he, he's not accused of making anything else up. Of course, they don't even say anything about it, but that's the deal. Got five minutes. Five minutes. This little prison here is, if I showed you how tall that was in the Israeli Museum or the British Museum, it's about 18 inches tall. Maybe 14 to 18 inches tall. Got a little bitty tiny writing on there. Uh, next page, you got the uh, Babylonian Chronicle. Babylonian Chronicle. Uh, we wish we had it all, we don't. But the Nebuchadnezzar and, and the kings that followed him, they kept a chronicle. We've got part of it. We have the, the capture of the city of Jerusalem, a few pages over. Uh, page 74. That's still, uh, that's still, that's easier had. I called out the kings of Kati, page 74, Kati land. Uh, Manasseh, king of Judah, was Manasseh king of Judah? You bet your life he was. And uh, he received tribute from him. And uh, uh, this tells exactly what went on. Then the Babylonian Chronicle gives you the Nebuchadnezzar and uh, his father, and what they did, and how he captured the city of Jerusalem in 597. And uh, he took a king off the throne and took him into exile. Uh, so, anyway, uh, you can just take that and look at it yourself. You can see that uh, 
it's just unbelievable. On page one last reference. On page 81, here's a reference to uh, the second day of the month, Adar. Mm -hmm. well, we, some scholars will say that's the 16th of March, some will say it's the 15th, but anyway, they argue about a day. I mean, just think how close we are. March 597, the Bible says that uh, Jehoiakim died, his son Jehoiachin became king and reigned three months. He died in December, he reigned part of December, all of January, all of February, and surrendered in March. Just like the Bible says. And uh, we could even give you the date, the second day of the month, March 16th. Like I say, some books might say March 17th. Uh, at the bottom of the, that column, it says the part, of the part of the Chronicle shows that Jehoiakim died on December the 7th, 598. Three months and ten days before the capture of Jerusalem. Of course, it tells us three months, that's close enough. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's just really absolutely amazing. Okay, uh, next week we're going into Egypt in the Bible, and we will deal with Moses. I think you will find that unbelievably fascinating. I'll give you what I think Moses lived and, and what the best king is for the Exodus. I'll give you even two or three other views. Um, any questions? Thank you for coming.